Hi, I'm Michael Igo, senior reporter at DevEx. We're here today talking about evidence, impact, and innovation within integrated development. Uh, this is a campaign that DevEx has partnered with FHI 360 uh, to examine how an intentional integrated approach to the design, delivery, and evaluation of programs has the potential to make an enduring difference in health, education, governance, and other areas that can improve people's lives. So I'm joined today by a great panel. We've got Shriek Gopal, who's the Director of Strategic Evaluation at FSG. We've got Laura Robson, who's a Community Health Programs Coordinator at Blue Ventures. We've got Shira Mitchell from Columbia University and the Millennium Villages Project. She's a lead statistician. And Tessa Honor McAfee, who's a Technical Coordinator at FHI 360. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who are following online, you're welcome to tweet uh, questions using the hashtag IntegratedDev, and you can also tweet them to at DevX. We'll be looking for them there. Um, and let's get started. So just to begin, uh, you know, guys, what are we talking about when we say integrated development? I mean, it's a fairly broad sort of catch-all term, um, but we want to talk about it in, in sort of more specific words here today. And, and make sure that we can pin down into some specifics. So what does integrated development look like? Where is the future? Um, and what sort of evident, evidence base have, has been built to show that something called integrated development is a really effective uh, term and um, way of looking at development that we should all be paying attention to? Tessa, do you want to go ahead and, and jump on that one? Sure, sure. So when we're talking about integrated development, we're talking about multi-sector interventions um, as well as single-sector single interventions that are focused on multi-sector outcomes. But we're also thinking about uh, political integration, organizational integration, and it is an incredibly broad um, subject. But when we're talking about the evidence, most of that is focused on the multi-sector, the technical evidence. So I think the best way to characterize the uh, integrated development evidence base right now is uh, spotty and mixed. Um, there are certain groups that have done a really good job at building out their evidence, like the PHE group, the Population Health and Environment group, does have a lot of evidence. And there are other pockets of communities that have done that, but we need to do a better job um, broadly building out that rigorous evidence. Um, I think one of the most important things to note is that um, these projects are being done, they're just not necessarily being rigorously evaluated in a way that looks at the integration. So um, we did an evidence review here um, that's in the process of being published that looked at impact evaluations um, that have been put together in the past decade. And um, in 2,600 impact evaluations, we found uh, 500 projects that were integrated, but only uh, eight of the studies were designed in a way to look at the integrated aspects of these uh, programs. So um, there is evidence in some areas, and um, there are these projects being done, but we need to do a better job at rigorously evaluating the integrated aspects of these prog programs. Great. Thanks, Tessa. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I mean, how are you you know, in your own organizations thinking about um, the various components that establish something as integrated development, and then how are you um, looking at those programs to judge whether or not they're effective? Um, sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, so I'm Laura Robson, I work for Blue Ventures, we're a marine conservation organization, and we um, we integrate reproductive health um, into our marine conservation and um, fisheries management work. So we kind of belong to a community um, that Tessa mentioned, kind of known as PHE, Population Health Environment, um, whereby we, yeah, we basically integrate um, family planning, reproductive health elements into natural resource management programs. Um, the Population Reference Bureau recently did um, a big kind of synthesis of the evidence of the impact of these kind of programs. Um, they looked at 43 documents um, from 35 projects, mostly beginning in the mid-2000s, and they found there was strong evidence of um, family planning and reproductive health outcomes, um, but it was more challenging for these programs to actually collect data and document um, environmental outcomes. Often these were um, 
kind of longer term outcomes that they might not be able to see over the course of a short project. Um, but the key thing that they identified, the key kind of gap in the evidence base that they've identified through this synthesis were the kind of added value benefits of integration. Um, so we have kind of anecdotal evidence of um, increased involvement of men in family planning, um, increased involvement of women in natural resource management, greater buy-in um, from communities for environmental initiatives that might be kind of slower burn compared to some of the more immediate kind of gains you see with health um, service provision, um, and time and cost savings that you see by working in an integrated way. And all of these benefits, um, these kind of added value benefits, we do have some anecdotal evidence of, but not a really strong evidence base. So I think that's, um, that's the real um, kind of priority area we need to be focusing um, integrated development research on over the coming years. Great, thank you, Laura. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this this fascinating topic of information and evidence gaps um, or opportunities to to sort of you know look for where that evidence might be built out? So I really liked what Tessa and Laura said about um, sort of trying to synthesize the information because I think maybe the best way I could characterize the evidence base is that it's really dispersed across a variety of disciplines um, that don't tend to read each other's literatures very often. Um, so I think that that's, that's, that's maybe, I don't know, what I see as, as some of the biggest, the biggest problem. And we need some way to accumulate evidence via anything from sort of literature reviews to sort of more formal things like meta-analyses and um, sort of building like big models with a lot of inputs from different uh, different disciplines. Yeah, and Michael, this is uh, Shrek, if I can jump in here. I think uh, I would agree with uh, all the other panelists. I think there's a couple of ways to think about evidence when it comes to innovative development. One is, um, as Shira said, thinking about, you know, related disciplines, right? I mean, integrated development fundamentally is about systems things, right? It's about the fact that, you know, there's a lot of connections, uh, that uh, programs aren't really just the isolated standalone, they're connected to everything around them, that it's about reconceiving, you know, services around the core beneficiary. It's about taking into account the role of context. I mean, all of this fundamentally is systems thinking. And you've got, you know, over half a century of literature on systems thinking and, and systems thinking approaches. Um, and uh, that's sort of one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is to look at, uh, you know, other, um, other terms Right, uh, and for instance, collective impact is a term we use uh, quite often in the U.S. That's uh, we don't call it integrated development, but essentially, uh, you know, FSD we do a lot of work um, on the idea of collective impact, which fundamentally is the same concept of these siloing services and uh, coordinating uh, activities uh, to serve beneficiaries. And I would say over the last you know five years or so, we've increasingly seen evidence that collective impact uh, is having an impact. Um, I mean, just this week, uh, the, we got news that the first ever uh, successful social impact bond effort in the U.S. Uh, is a collective impact effort in Salt Lake City. Uh, and the one before that that actually didn't succeed uh, was more of what you wouldn't call collective impact, so focusing on one nonprofit or a standalone providing services. So, I mean, it's still, uh, I would say, an emerging field in terms of uh, gathering evidence, but uh, I, I think uh, one way we could uh, help our case is to just broaden um, our, our lens a little bit on how we think about evidence for integrated development. Great, great. So, Shriek, I mean, you made the important point that, you know, this is a, a sort of school of thought or at least an aspect of, of thinking about development that's been around for a while. I mean, people have recognized that, you know, systems thinking has a, a strong role to play in, in solving many of these extremely complex interconnected challenges. Um, but still, the international development community, however we want to define that, has, you know, grown up and, and built up around a fairly sort of siloed uh, funding stream model. Yeah. And I'm wondering, as the four of you look at, you know, your own organizations and the organizations that you're partnering with or that are in your sort of broader ecosystem of, of implementation, is the international development um, community of professionals well set up to think about these issues? In other words, is it um, possible for health sector specialists to be talking with education spe specialists as those two uh, sectors are currently sort of defined and separated? Or do we need a, a new sort of class of integrated development professionals to, to take on these challenges? What do you guys think? 
Um, I'm happy to weigh in with Blue Ventures' experience. I think this is something we're really grappling with um, because we have obviously um, specialists on our team. We have people who are specialized in health, we have people who are specialized in you know, fisheries scientists working alongside aquaculture technicians, working alongside um, you know, midwives. And so how do we actually work together effectively? And this is something we're really trying to do um, within our organization by doing cross trainings within teams. Um, so at the very local level when we've got our kind of community outreach officers, um, the, conservation, um, the conservation officers are being trained in family planning. They go along to those workshops and vice versa. So that's how we're trying to um, address this challenge at, at a kind of um, grassroots level. Um, and then further up within our organization, there's just a lot of cross-exchange um, and trying to kind of read up and learn about each other's sectors. So, I mean, I'm from a health background and I'm working in a conservation organization, so I'm learning about fisheries management from my colleagues. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting environment to be working in. It's really um, enriching. You know, you learn a lot. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really the future is we have to be able to, um, to speak to each other and understand each other's um, sectors and, and disciplines. Um, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with Laura. Um, with our experience at FHI 360, we've been working hard to start to that integration process, you know, um, and it, it, it takes a long time um, to get people, both the technical people who are um, good at two different sectors, uh, maybe health and education or um, environment and family planning, um, but also those people who are the integrators, who do have experience um, integrating different sectors. Um, so we've, we're working on that, and I think other organizations are as well, um, starting to see where we can turn our lens inward and look at if we're implementing integrated projects, we really have to be integrated um, in ourselves to really think about how we are doing development. Um, so we need to, that, that's a long-term process, but um, I think it's possible and I think it has started. I remember, I think, a, a few years ago, um, Tim Brown from IDEO had uh, uh, an article uh, that was widely circulated. Uh, it was in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, uh, I believe, uh, or I mean, it might have been the Harvard Business Review. But uh, essentially, he talked about the kind of people that's needed uh, to solve these complex social problems. And he talked about a, a kind of a key profile, right? You kind of have the vertical of uh, deep uh, specialized knowledge. It, it doesn't go away. I think it's still important for the work we're doing. We also kind of have the horizontal of people being to, uh, willing to be interdisciplinary, so engineers working with uh, artists um, or community developers, you know, working with scientists. So whatever that sort of interdisciplinary, uh, there, but there, there is a certain kind of aptitude, there's a certain skill set, uh, I think there's a certain, you know, um, core of knowledge that's needed even to do that interdisciplinary that I don't think we're as focused on as we should be in the sector. Yeah, I definitely agree with with all of the speakers. Uh, so as I have, uh, I have a statistics and math background, um, uh, but I sort of consider myself a very applied statistician, which involves talking to uh, people who actually know something about the subjects uh, uh, in, you know, across, across a wide variety of public health and economic development, engineering, et cetera. Um, and sometimes for me, the barrier is sort of understanding what other people's questions are and realizing, uh, you know, the, the, some common language because uh, sometimes you know I'll be talking about one thing and they'll seemingly be talking about something else and eventually we realize we're talking about the same thing. Um, so that happens a lot. Uh, there's even a divide between the way statisticians and sort of uh, economists, even of you know very quantitative variety, tend to approach sort of experimental design and thoughts about that. Um, so I've I've definitely learned a lot in sort of trying to. Uh, trying to bridge bridge those gaps as, as mostly an outsider. So I think you're all hinting towards, um, I don't know if it's a tension, but at least a, a consideration about the fact that these are extremely difficult challenges that we're talking about, and they do require um, you know, in-depth expertise in certain subjects in order to be able to speak and act authoritatively on them. But at the same time, we're looking for these connections with other things. So you know, there's a bit of a, a tension there between the the long years of earned experience in one particular subject that really is necessary to get this stuff done, um, but then the ability to think more broadly as well. And with that in mind, it seems to me that there are situations where 
um, a more sort of streamlined, sectoral, dare I say, vertical approach to solving something is going to be the right one. And then there are situations where, you know, a, a truly integrated approach is the right one. How do you differentiate those situations from each other? What sort of evidence is helpful in being able to make those determinations? Um, and are we able to make those determinations now, or is that, you know, where the, uh, the evidence is, is really needed? I'm happy to jump in first there. I, I, mean, I would ask, you know, fundamentally um, three questions. There are probably more questions, but three come to mind for me. One is, um, you know, how important is context in this initiative? Right. I mean, if you're doing, if you're, you know, if your uh, goal is to is to get contraceptives out in the in rural areas in Africa, does it matter if it's, you know, a, a rural part of Uganda versus an urban part of Kenya? Does it does context really matter? And I think if it does, uh, then it it argues for more of a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach because it's not just the technical expertise uh, about, you know. Even if you have the best contraception in the world, it may still not work. Uh, so context, I think, is one major question. Um, the second question I would ask is, you know, how um, isolatable, for lack of a better phrase, is your program or initiative? Right? Is it again? Is it this? Is it does it live in a bubble where uh, you know you can actually control uh, how it's designed, delivered, uh, and so on, or is it really connected to everything around it? Um, and then the third question I would ask is, um, how uh, linear or predictable is the causality within that initiative? Right? If the A leads to B, X leads to Y, how sure are you that that's going to happen? And if the answer to all these three questions is, you know, maybe or no, I would say it argues more for an interdisciplinary approach. If the answer to all these questions is yes, first I would double check your answers, <laughs> and then I would say. Yeah, I mean, if, it, if that's you know truly the case, then yes, I would, I would. I think it calls for more of a, a traditional specialized approach. Yeah, no, I I agree that sort of a lot of checking probably has to happen to make sure something doesn't require outside experts. I think it's it's very common when you're in a particular field to really only see to have a kind of a narrow vision and to only see what you were trained to see, which make is natural and makes sense. It's not, um, yeah. I, but so maybe one sort of insurance policy is to have at least sort of a handful of people from a variety of different disciplines. It doesn't have to be sort of a giant team of, from each discipline, but maybe one representative that could kind of tell you, hey, yeah, you're going to need to talk to a lot more, you know, public health experts, or you're going to need to talk to a lot more people who know about this other thing. And um, uh, I don't know, just just to sort of, yeah, uh, as an insurance policy to make sure that you're not missing something because your expertise is particularly narrow. Yeah, I think adding on that, um, I think we need to remember that integrated development shouldn't be the goal. Evidence-based development should be the goal. So we need to develop more evidence rigorously w so we know where integrated development is best practice and where those siloed focused approaches are best practice. And I think we can start um, in the places where we do already have that preliminary evidence, um, and we do have that, that, you know, biological plausibility, it makes sense. Um, but I think those those are really excellent questions, and I think in most cases, some form of integration does at least need to be evaluated. We need to give it that thought. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree totally with everything that's been said, and I think it um, it really highlights, I think, again, the evidence gap um, that really needs filling, which is about the value added of um, of integrated approaches and actually developing a context-specific um, understanding of that. So really, I think the point about context is key, not just, um, you know, understanding these programs as operating in a vacuum, but looking at how in certain contexts they may be more appropriate, but in other contexts a more narrow vertical approach may be more impactful. So really trying to develop an understanding of what is a value added and in which contexts. Um, yeah. Laura, I like your, your framing of, of thinking about the value add in, you know, um, sort of layering on the, the integrated approach. And it, it strikes me that one sort of maybe helpful, maybe challenging way to think about this is, you know, what is the value added by doing a more narrowly sectoral approach? And one of the things that, that strikes me in these discussions um, is that when you have that individual sector, you know, 
one implementer or group of implementers responsible for the outcomes of one particular type of program, you have what Shriek was talking about, which is that sort of causal argument. And one of the things that that does is it allows you to hold those actors accountable for the outcomes of their projects. So I, it strikes me as an interesting challenge that when you start to see things as more multi-sectoral and more integrated, um, that this question of, of accountability and sort of ownership of project outcomes is going to become more difficult. So for example, if you're working in education, but you're now more fully aware of uh, the role that health uh, factors are playing in your education outcomes, doesn't that sort of give you license to deny anything that goes wrong in your project because, you know, oh, it was all a result of, of everything that was happening with the health in this community. So, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about how to sort of maintain that clear accountability and responsibility for, for quality projects while sort of broadening the scope of how all of these different factors um, fit together and influence each other? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's a really difficult, complex question. I, th I think um, the key really is to try and look at those causal mechanisms and understand the processes through which these different programs um, interact to generate those outcomes. Um, I think that's something that the PhD community is kind of struggling with. Um, you know, how do we, we're seeing that, we, we're seeing what we think is, is value added, but how is that coming about and, and what, what is going on here in these very complex, complex interventions where you've got different sectors kind of contributing. So you might have, for example, in Blue Ventures program, um, more women are getting involved in fisheries management. Now is that because um, the kind of fisheries team are doing loads of outreach with women and, and women's groups, or is it because um, women are using family planning and um, they've got more time or they've got more confidence to engage in fisheries management? So in that sense, I mean, I think we can see that outcome as, as a shared achievement between different teams. But, yeah, I mean, it's something we need to try and investigate. And that's something that um, Blue Ventures is really keen to investigate, not only what are the value-added benefits and outcomes, but also trying to generate evidence, qualitative and quantitative evidence, to try and map out some of those processes and pathways. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not easy. It's not straightforward at all. <laughs> yeah, I agree with um, Laura. I think it's important to map out the pathways. And, and then you can do one of two things or both. One is, you know, you can hold individual providers accountable for some of more of the intermediate outcomes that they do have uh, direct control over, uh, but those intermediate outcomes have to be picked carefully to be proxies for the, the ultimate outcomes. So they're just not you know, any kind of intermediate outcome. They, you know, for example, with education, of they're able to improve school attendance. We know that, you know, that has some correlation to actual, you know, students actually learning. Well, they have to come to school first. Um, whereas, you know, to actually hold them accountable to a downstream outcome of, you know, students graduating or, you know, earning money, whatever those downstream outcomes are, I think it's unreasonable. Uh, so you can definitely hold them accountable to some of the intermediate outcomes. And the other thing you could do is uh, what Laura mentioned, which is more of a collective accountability. Uh, in If the uh, initiative is fully integrated, how can you structure accountability uh, to be more collective rather than individual? Um. So I'll jump in, and I, I definitely agree with all of this, I especially like the sort of intermediate outcomes idea. Um, I think those should almost always be looked at uh, to understand causal pathways. Uh, sort of quantitatively, you can estimate the impact on the intermediate outcome and on the final outcome, and um, combined with some qualitative evidence, that could, you know, stories could sort of begin to emerge. Um, how I was trained sort of quantitatively to assess interactions between uh, different programs or, or treatments uh, is, is factorial design, right? So if you have two, if you have A and B, treatments A and B, or just think about it as sectors A and B, uh, you could have four groups, uh, one group that gets uh, no interventions, one that gets A only, one that gets B only, and one that gets both. Um, and, uh, and then you can learn about the interactions. Um, and that's, that's great, except then um, think about if you don't have just A and B and you have, you know, uh, five different sectors, then you have two to the five, right, possible sets of, uh, you know, it's, it starts to get big really fast, right, um, possible sets of groups, and then you have a big sample size issue. Um, so uh, although this was definitely the way I was trained to, to answer these questions, right, uh, it can't be the only way. Uh, I, if it can be done in some 
situations, great. Um, it should be part of the evidence base, but, uh, but it certainly can't be the only way that we answer these, these questions. Yeah, I think one thing we found in, in the PhD community is the kind of um, the randomized control trial uh, approach. Is, it kind of falls down a bit because we are talking about these quite complex interventions where we do think there are kind of nonlinear processes going on. Um, and it's quite difficult to compare across, you know, control for variables across different contexts. So I think that's why we're moving towards, um, I'd say generally as a community, but certainly Blue Ventures, more of these kind of grounded context specific approaches of understanding, like a kind of process evaluation of what is going on within our program rather than trying to compare it to, you know, just a health program in this place or just a conservation program in this place. I mean, I do think that's valuable. There was a study um, that was done by the Path Foundation in the Philippines um, probably about five or so years ago, which was which did give really um, compelling evidence for the benefits of an integrated approach. Um, but now we've kind of, I think, generally as a community moved on to these kind of, uh, to question more like what it, what are the processes through which the outcomes are generated rather than just the end outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just building off of what uh, Laura and Shira have said, um, I also am very supportive of that rigorous evidence, but we do still need those process valuations, the qualitative evidence to really see you know, how these programs are being implemented. And I think in a lot of situations, that technical evidence is it's difficult to expand um, beyond that specific situation that um, that study has been done in. But if you can take these um, less rigorous but just as important qualitative evidence, process evaluation um, type of evidence, you can apply that across sectors, across different integrated projects. So that's incredibly value and in it's valuable in its own right. And I think as well, just to build on that quickly, I think as well we can also build in these quantitative, um, sort of the intermediate indicators within our process evaluations to kind of add some rigor. So it's not just anecdotal, oh, this person says this is how it works, but actually kind of testing that with, with some quantitative data as well. Um, and the other thing we can do is compare those, those, uh, those processes, quite in-depth process evaluations across different contexts and see if there's some similar mechanisms or processes that are emerging. So within the PhD community, we could see, is there something going on here between this link between family planning and natural resource management um, in different contexts? And then we can sort of start to develop a kind of meta theory, I guess, um, to understand how these programs work. Great. So I mean, we've got a, a panel here of people with obviously really sophisticated thinking and great ideas about how you would all like to see this done. Does it work in the business environment that we're all faced with as global development professionals, many of whom are receiving funding from donors who have you know, certain requirements and specifications about the way that their money gets spent. What sort of a, a mindset shift is needed? What sort of uh, shift is needed in the way that you know, procurement is happening and contracting and grants are happening? Are you finding that you're able to implement these ideas that you have um, given the sort of restrictions that currently exist? And would they be able to impl be implemented at a larger scale? Or are there some real changes that need to happen first um, that would enable these things to, to become a reality? Well, I do think the road leads back to donors. Um, because, I mean, if you think about, you know, sort of fundamentally, if you accept the premise that structure influences behavior, we have to change the structures. Um, that influence the way we be behave in the sector, which right now tends to be more siloed, more uh, more in the vertical. And uh, I I do think the tide is, is shifting. I mean, I've seen evidence in you know recent RFPs and projects, more uptake, uh, a, a gradual mindset shift uh, among funders, uh, and and funders are in in a unique position actually to incentivize multi sector collaboration. Right? I mean, nonprofits by themselves aren't going to say oh great, this is actually going to be uh, wonderful for me to, to uh, take the pain to go and collaborate with someone. And so that, needs to, that needs to be incentivized by others. And uh, you know, a recent uh, client of mine, a large sort of national and international funder, you know, talked about a story where uh, they published an RFP and they actually uh, publicized everyone, uh, the names of every organization the RFP was going to. There were about a dozen organizations that the RFP was going to, they publicized the names. And they said, you know what, we would actually value 
uh, proposals that come from multiple ones of you. So I ended up having about, I think, five or six proposals, but all each one of those dozen organizations was represented in those five or six proposals. Everybody basically collaborated because uh, the foundation kind of, you know, set out uh, the structure that that's what's valued. So I, I do think, you know, fundamentally we have to think about, you know, what are the levers to push to change mindset behaviors of uh, large foundations of large multi multilaterals. So I want to hear from others on this, but I also I want to um, challenge you to take up that that question that Shriek just ended with, which is what are the levers to push? I mean, how can those who are advocates of an integrated approach, when it's appropriate, um, more effectively make the case that that's something that should happen and that the the freedom to allow it to happen should be granted to organizations who are capable and interested in doing it. So uh, I'll jump in and say that I think part of what's needed is better communication of whatever evidence we do have. Um, so that includes you know, data visualization uh, with data broadly defined, not even necessarily just quantitative, but really uh, working to, uh, to better understand the evidence that we do have and communicate it uh, to, to interested parties. That's definitely needed. Yeah, I think just to add on that, communication has been um, something that we have grappled with because integrated development is such a um, broad term. And it's like the question, does integrated development work? It's, it's so broad that you can say yes and you can say no and you can be right in certain situations. So communicating what's going on both internally and externally is incredibly important. Um, and I think doing a better job at you know turning that lens inward again, like uh, Shriek was saying, and um, I mentioned earlier, just looking at our own structures. I think I could share um, a few examples from what Blue Ventures has seen in, in Madagascar. I think Shriek's example of um, of the of the funder that issued that call for collaborative working is wonderful. I think that's um, kind of what we saw in Madagascar with a number of. Um, conservation and health program, uh, health organizations worked together um, in the kind of mid-2000s with USAID support. So there was a big um, kind of push to, to advance PHE in Madagascar at that time, um, which I think was quite um, donor-driven and, and quite successful in getting those organizations who traditionally wouldn't work together to actually start collaborating. Um, now what we're seeing in Madagascar is um, the funding situation has kind of changed a bit, but um, we're seeing that conservation and health um, organizations are, are starting to collaborate and pool funds. So the, the health organization has, so for example, Mary Stopes Madagascar, have, they have um, funding to, to provide family planning services in remote uh, rural areas. And we have conservation organizations with funding to do environmental work in those same regions. And they're just basically combining their, their funded activities. Um, so that's another approach I think that can work quite well. Um, what Blue Ventures has done to develop our PHE program, we've had funding um, from slightly different donors for our, for our health and for our conservation programs. So each program is kind of um, funded separately, but obviously in the field we're really integrating and, and combining them quite closely. Um, we've also had the opportunity to engage some of our donors and kind of bring them on board with our health work. So we've had um, conservation donors who have come to visit our site and um, see the work they're funding and then see that how the health program kind of feeds into that and contributes to that. And as a result, they've started funding our health work. So that's been a really nice um, way of kind of broadening um, broadening our funding, uh, our donor base, really, for, for that work. So I think that can also work, just engaging with donors, showing how different um, elements of an integrated approach feeds into the things that they care about, um, and, and kind of getting them on board in that, in that way. It's yeah. A, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to add on to that, I think operating within a funding structure that is basically siloed at this point. Um, there have been some programs both here, um, WASH Plus comes to mind, that have been able to really get funding from different groups of funders because they are integrated. So you can use a siloed funding structure to your advantage as an integrated project. I was just going to reiterate the point that I think, you know, a few of you have made now that, you know, part of the impetus is on the implementers to, to you know, look at the world of funding that's available and then figure out how to turn that funding into an integrated approach to development. And it's interesting to think about sort of, you know, even if the flexibility isn't built into the procurement systems at the outset, 
are there ways of achieving that flexibility sort of further down the, the road? And Laura, I think you had some, some great examples of how that's possible. Um, so the four of you represent organizations that are clearly thinking about these issues and, and um, putting them into action. What is it about some organizations, do you think, based on the experiences that you've had, um, that sort of predispose them to, to this integrated mindset? What prevents other organizations from, from thinking this way? Um, basically, I'm, I'm giving you guys a chance to sort of brag about the places you work. But I mean, you know, what is it that, that can, uh, what can organizations do to, to sort of move themselves a little further down this, this line of thought if it's something that they're interested in doing? Um, I think from, from the Ventures perspective, um, the kind of, our, our PhD journey really um, evolved as, as a result of listening to communities. So um, one of our organizational values is, is putting communities first and, and responding to their needs. And um, when we started working in Madagascar, we were a marine conservation organization um, surveying coral reefs, looking at the state of coral reefs, and soon figured out, okay, we actually need to look at um, fisheries management because um, fisheries, are, 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 you know, this is the kind of um, lifeblood, economic lifeblood of, of local communities. And then as a, as a result of engaging with them on fisheries management, they came to us and started talking about health needs. And so we ended up kind of becoming, developing this, this PhD program and becoming a PhD organization, not necessarily intentionally. So I think, um, I, I think that that's one, one thing is, is really who are you accountable to? Um, and if you're accountable to the communities you serve, um, then I, I think, uh, you know, in most, in most cases you will end up developing integrated programs because they're not living their lives in silos. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're experiencing multiple challenges across sectors. And so, you know, if, if we take their needs and, and their, um, their reality as a starting point, I think, you know, that's when we start developing these integrated um, programs. Yeah, I think uh, you know, the biggest thing that organizations can do is develop um, this discipline of reflective practice within themselves and continually ask the question, is what we're doing having an impact, having a social impact? Uh, if, if I think about you know FSG's journey over the last 15 years, or so we started off as foundation strategy group doing you know strategy consulting for foundation, and over time we realized that you know while strategy consulting is very successful in the business world, uh, in the social sector it, it need we needed to sort of widen our lens. We needed to think about multi-sector approaches. We needed to think about you know putting the beneficiaries in the center and. You know, our work evolved to things like collective impact and, and systems change. And I think, you know, but, but that came about, you know, not by accident, but by continually asking ourselves, you know, is what we're delivering for clients actually having an impact? And if you're asking that question, you can't not go to more systemic, more integrated approaches. Yeah, so just uh, adding on to what both of you have said, um, and especially what Laura said, um, locally driven solutions have been a really integral part of where integrated development has started for us. Um, just asking what communities needed and, you know, people aren't, like you said, people aren't living their lives in silos. Um, problems are complex um, and so should the solutions be. Um, I think we also took the approach that we do have a lot of different experts from different fields here um, and we needed to know, really start thinking about how to get those people to be working together um, and think about where we could, what experts we could use as a jumping off point, uh, what expertise we could use as a jumping off point. So um, thinking about gender or youth or technology as these cross-cutting themes, um, when you come into it with that mindset, you can start to think about communities broadly instead of just uh, single sector problems. Um, so unlike uh, the other experts on the panel, I, I sort of haven't been at my organization very long and uh, uh, I joined a little over a year ago uh, as a statistician to sort of work on the impact evaluation, that end line impact evaluation for the Millennium Villages project. Um, but it, my understanding of the project uh, is that, you know, when it was founded uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, it was, you know, with the goal of achieving the Millennium Development Goals, which were a broad set uh, of goals. So it was sort of from the very beginning uh, designed to address all of these issues because as 
uh, as you all have mentioned, you know, a community doesn't have only one specific need at a time conveniently uh, aligned with, with a particular project. It's, you know, um, there's, it's messy and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, needs that are sometimes complementary and sometimes maybe the opposite of that. Um, so, uh, so that's my understanding of the Money and Villages project, but, but this is certainly not my, uh, my particular area of expertise. <laughs> Great. Um, one of the things that strikes me here is that you know we're we're talking about a sort of level of integration um, that is very genuine, very well thought through, and and sort of deeply considered at the real kind of um, project planning stage. Do any of you have concerns that people might sort of say they're doing integration, but in fact they're just sort of doing a health program and doing a an environmental program and they're somewhere in the same vicinity how do you determine or how do you differentiate between sort of what you would all consider you know a really integrated approach and just sort of paying lip service to that I suspect that it has something to do with the the research that you're building into it and to the way that these um, processes are sort of built into the way that an organization thinks about its programs, but I'd be curious to to know. I mean, if if you know, we're if members of our audience here are looking around and wondering, do we already do integration? <laughs> I mean, what are some of the the things that you would point to to say, you know, this is what it looks like to really take this seriously, and and this not so much. I think I, I can start here. Um, this is definitely a conversation we have had many times on where's that line between doing two separate programs in the same community and doing integrated development. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of different things that you can use to draw that line. Um, a couple of the things that, I, that come to mind for me are um, getting those people in the same room, being implemented by the same people. Um, one, of, one of the examples um, for integrated development that we use is um, as a way to, like as a platform basically to access different communities. So um, integra uh, integrating health interventions into the education sector is a good like, basic example of that. And that's getting people who are working in the education sector and working in the health sector to work together on a single outcome, right? So it, it's a complicated um, question to answer, but and it's, it's a little case by case. Um, but I think you just need to start thinking about how these people are working together and integrating all the different things that they are doing in indicators and outcomes um, and how they're evaluating um, not just the population. Uh, I, I would just say, I mean, there's a spectrum of collaboration that could exist, right? I mean, from coexisting to cooperating to uh, really truly collaborating. And, you know, one way we've thought about this, uh, again, going back to the notion of collective impact, which I think is really truly an integrated approach, is to think about some basic elements that need to be present. And, and we've you know written a lot about the five elements of collective impact. It's not rocket science, but is there is there a common agenda, right? Is there a backbone organization that's kind of coordinating the various parties? Uh, is, are, are the are activities of the different parties mutually reinforcing, right? Mutually reinforcing activities. Is there continuous and constant communication going on? Uh, is there a shared measurement system that actually, uh, you know, looks at the right outcomes and indicators and it's transparent across the, the different parties and sectors? So there are some ways to think about, you know, again, how do you ratchet up that level of collaboration from you know, merely coexisting or cooperating to true authentic collaboration? Yeah, I think... Um Building kind of on, on what Tessa was saying as well, I think similarly at Blue Ventures we're also having these conversations of, you know, how, how do we know that we are truly integrating and not just running, you know, lots of parallel projects in the same communities. Um, and I think the way we um, conceptualize integration is really um, our community outreach as, as being the kind of glue that holds everything together. So when we hold community meetings, um, we're discussing health and natural resource management um, topics at the same time with groups of men and women, mixed groups. Um, so that's really, I, I think, yeah, the, the glue that basically holds all of those different uh, programs together. And that's something we're looking at now with the Madagascar PHG network, where we have these health and these conservation organizations starting to partner with each other to make sure that those aren't just, you know, running, again, like two 
to uh, single sector programs alongside each other, but actually how do we make sure that these are, are very well linked in the community? And I think um, um, the point you know that was made about making sure that everyone's coordinated, everyone's on the same page, has the same agenda is also very important. So, um, you know, we have weekly team meetings in the field where people are coordinating travel schedules. You know, when when we have a health worker in a village, she can answer questions about, you know, what's going on with fisheries management and just making sure that all of those lines of communication are open um, and that things are, yeah, are basically running as, um, as integrated as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in just to answer sort of a meta version of that question. Um, so, in terms of integration in the evaluation framework, so, so you you have qualitative and quantitative methods, and everyone sort of says that both of them are great, and we should combine them into mixed methods, and that's that's like a really neat idea. Um, but at least in the literature I'm familiar with, there's not a lot of discussion about how to do that. Um, and uh, I've seen some really interesting work uh, by McCartan Humphreys sort of looking at uh, ways to build qualitative clues into quantitative Bayesian models and kind of really in a formal mathematical way integrate these things, uh, which I think is pretty neat. Um, but, but that's right now what I'm struggling with is integrating the, the qualitative and quantitative evidence. Great. Well, we're running up against time here, um, and I just, you know, I'd love to sort of open the floor um, to give you guys a chance to just sort of give us a sense of, of where you think the, the greatest opportunities um, for this um, integrated development agenda lie. What are the things that you're excited to be working on um, and what do you think the, the greater part of our audience should be paying attention to to uh, sort of be keeping tabs on how this, this both mindset and also sort of, as we've established, somewhat specific way of thinking about programs develops. Um, what's what's exciting on the horizon? Um, I guess I'll, I'll I'll just jump in first. Uh, with, on the methods side, I think there needs to be. Um, I think everyone's talked a little bit about sort of external validity issues. Like if you figure out what works in one context, how do you decide uh, what will work somewhere else? And I think there needs to be a lot more. You know, meta-analysis and, and accumulation of evidence in the literature, um, a lot of which already exists and is just not um, sort of collectively analyzed. Um, and uh, to that effect, I think that there needs to be more standardization across organizations and across countries of uh, some of the measurement and estimation tools. So, you know, even these, uh, these development indicators, uh, some of which sound like, yeah, they should be the same across contexts. Uh, they really aren't estimated the same way. And then if you're making comparisons, it can be very hard to, to understand what you're looking at. Um, so I think that's 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 the next step that, that I would like to see happen. Well, I just think there's, there's an increasing uh, realization that you know, to really solve these chronic social issues, whether it be poverty, inequity, education, health, um, you know, we need a different approach. We need uh, an interdisciplinary approach. We need an integrated approach. Uh, but I think the exciting thing is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the tide is turning. Um, you know, just in the past year or so, you know, three large U.S. based foundations, Ford, MacArthur, Robert Wood Johnson, have really put their stake in the ground around, you know, that we are about systems change. That we are about, you know, taking a multidisciplinary. Uh, for example, Robert Wood Johnson talks about the social determinants of health. That health is not an isolated issue; it, it relates to all these other social determinants. Uh, Ford talks about how, you know, poverty and inequity to really solve it, we need to take a sort of much more of a wide-angle lens. Um, Kellogg has been talking about. It. So, I mean, these are again large U.S. Fund funders that have um, the uh, wherewithal and the sort of uh, mouthpiece. Uh, that the world would listen to. So I do think it's exciting um, to hear this shift, at least in uh, verbiage for now. Uh, I think action would likely follow, but just, just to see this level of awareness and dialogue is exciting. Just to add on to what both of you have said, um, this is it's an incredibly um, exciting field to be a part of right now, just because there has been um, this shift towards focusing on integration, multi-sector um, development, and especially with the SDGs um, and our changing focus over the next 15 years, um, it's definitely a growing field. Um, I think other things that I'm excited about are the growing evidence that is is coming out. People are developing more studies. Um, we have 
uh, studies going here in our Aspires project looking at uh, economic strengthening and health interventions and how um, rigorously looking at how those two come together and the synergies there. Um, the PHE community, there's lots of different studies going on. Um, it's just, it's a really um, exciting field to be in and um, be looking for all of that coming out in the next few years. Great. We've got just a couple of minutes and we've had a couple of questions come in from our audience here, a couple more questions. Um, so I'm just going to ask these two which have come in um, and then you guys can take them at your will. Um, so the first one is about technology tools. Um, are, are there technology tools that you're using uh, to help with integrated development for collaboration, performance management, knowledge management? Um, and then the second one that I wanted to, to zero in on, um, and I think Shira, this might go to you most specifically. Um, does the panel think donor bias for quantifiable impact outcomes? Um, in other words, data that fits with log frames, logical frameworks, um, impede integrated development evaluation. So two more questions from our audience there. We've just got a couple minutes, but if you guys want to try to tackle them quickly, that would be great. Uh, so, so I guess uh, there, there seems to be, in terms of the sort of quantitative, I do think that there is a quantitative bias uh, I've, in a lot of organizations and a lot of people sort of trust numbers a little bit too much, um, especially when there aren't, you know, intervals of uncertainty around them and, and all of that. And, and, and even as a numbers person, I'm, I'm very aware of the dangers of putting numbers out there that, that don't have a lot of caveats. So I think that there's, there's too much trust in numbers, probably. Um, uh, and then I think in terms of sort of evidence around if, if, if one does want to go the quantitative route and like we're uh, like I'm leading at the Millennium Villages project, one aspect of the evaluation is an impact evaluation. So looking at quantitative impact on, on a variety of development outcomes. Um, I think there's there's some misunderstanding around uh, whether that can be done with an integrated project. Like can you um, uh, can you you evaluate uh, a project that is that is complicated and, and changing over time and such and and the answer is yes you just you know the the treatment in that case gets defined as as whatever was done that complex set of interventions um, it doesn't have to be sort of a pill like you imagine maybe uh, in, in a very controlled clinical trial setting um, so I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding around that uh, but more importantly I think is the issue around being a little bit too too um, too numbers focused, and, and this is coming from someone who is a numbers person, um, uh, or at least not skeptical enough about about the numbers and what they're telling you. Um, and yeah, so I'll end on that cynical, slightly cynical note. Yeah, and I would just add that you know, as we, as we uh, go down the road of really exploring integrated development, you know, even to look at existing uh, frameworks like log frame. Uh, I'm going back to the idea of you know, there are current structures that impede a uh, certain way of behaving. And looking at whether, you know, again, there are some uh, opportunities or, or initiatives for which lock frames are the right answer. They really do bring discipline and intentionality uh, to the table. But there are some uh, occasions where they're not the right answer. You, you need, you know, more complex, you know, mapping tools or visualization tools or, uh, you know, uh, social network analysis, whatever those might be. To really get uh, get uh, to really understand and, and learn about the initiative, uh, and and just a, a nod to the technology question, I do think I mean, one thing I am excited about is I see more and more uh, technology solutions out there for things like visual mapping. Uh, I mean, they're not sophisticated uh, yet, uh, but I think it's just a matter of time where we can you know sit in our different remote offices on different continents and do uh, you know use mapping software together. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. Great. Well, unless anyone else wants to weigh in quickly, now's your final chance. Great. Well, I just want to thank our, our panelists. This has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so thanks, Shriek, Laura, Shira, and Tessa for joining us today uh, to talk about integrated development. And I, get, I hope we get to do it again. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>